ever heard of the Hexen Circle? If you hadn't gone through Lisa's voice lines or Barbara's character stories, you probably hadn't heard of them until the 3.5 Windbloom event. The word itself is German, meaning hexing circle, which is what we'd call a witch's coven in English. And while most have probably never thought of this organization as particularly interesting in and of itself, three of their most notable members have garnered a lot of attention from players since the very beginning of the game. Those three are Klee's mother Alice, Mona's master Bar Belloff, and Albedo's master, the Conrian alchemist, Rhindaughter, aka gold. Well, there's obviously a lot more to them than just that, so in this video I want to spark things up a little and take a closer look at this mysterious group. We are going deep, and I mean really deep, into each individual member of the Hexen Circle as well as the organization as a whole. Consider this video your complete but still a bit speculative guide to all things Hexen Circle. It's gonna be a magical time, but if floating tea parties and pointy hats aren't really enough magic for you, perhaps I can offer you some red magic, courtesy of this video's sponsor, Nubia. This right here is Nubia's brand new Red Magic 8 Pro gaming phone in silver, and true to its name, it's a pretty magical mobile gaming experience. It's got a 6.8 inch AMOLED screen, 20 by 9 resolution, 128 hertz refresh rate, and that means 60 FPS gaming, and it's got Gorilla Glass 5, which protects your screen from cracks and scratches. The Red Magic 8 Pro makes games look nice, and pretty sharp too. This phone's also got some real power under the hood with Qualcomm's latest Snapdragon 8 2nd Gen processor, which is literally the fastest in its category and extremely energy efficient to boot. Plus, it's got a secondary chip solely dedicated to gaming functions only. That means even the most taxing games like Genshin will run without any nasty frame drops. Uh, what's that? You've noticed me casting my character's skill without touching the screen? Is it magic? Nah, but it kind of feels that way sometimes. This phone actually has two touch triggers, which you can configure through the Red Magic app by swiping twice on the side of the screen. This might be my favorite feature because it essentially lets me feel like I'm playing with a controller rather than just a touch screen. The app also lets you monitor the game's performance, remap your keys, equalize your audio, and adjust the internal cooling system, including the fan speed. The Red Magic 8 Pro also comes with a super fast charging system, which from my testing can get your phone from about 25% battery to 100% in about 30 minutes. And I'm only just getting started on new features. We've also got a headphone jack, the rarest of all mobile features, dual speakers, the ability to plug into external devices through HDMI, and a whole lot more. You can find a complete list of features on the Red Magic website by using my link located in the description box below. If you're in the market for a new phone, then you should definitely check this baby out. Thanks to Nubia and the Red Magic 8 Pro phone for sponsoring this video, and now that we've got all the magic that we need, it's time to get witchy. As I've already stated, the Hexen Circle is just a coven of witches. Now, traditionally, covens need at least three members, and the Hexen Circle appears to have at least eight members plus an unknown number of successors. There does appear to be some type of delineation of rank, as Alice, in particular, is referred to as an elder, whereas others, like Mona and Scarlet, are called successors. For the purposes of this video, I will assume that all eight witches depicted in this circle at the beginning of the trailer only refer to the Elder rank, so people like Alice, Barbelleth, and Rhindaughter. As for what these witches get up to, not too much is known about this, but we can make a few inferences. Lisa says that the Hexen Circle mostly preoccupies itself with tea parties and the investigation of Ermensul. However, we know that Mona's master, Barbelleth, either developed or mastered the art of hydromancy, which is a type of astrological divination, while Rhindaughter is a master alchemist adept in the forbidden art of Chemia. Ander's daughter, on the other hand, is an author, and so is Alice, technically, although she's more commonly called an adventurer. And then Nicole's interests lie in the fate and laws of the world itself. Now, believe it or not, every one of these areas of research tie back to Ermensel directly. Now, I did a much more thorough job of explaining things in this video on the Hexen Circle and Forbidden Knowledge that I made a while back, but here's the TLDR if you don't have time to watch that. Ermensul is basically the tree of life that sits at the center of the world, with its roots stretching deep into the abyss and its branches reaching into the sky. It collects all memories of the entire world, and tampering with it can cause memory loss of everyone in the entire world. So the whole world's memory, the collective memory, changes. 
We've seen this happen twice with Ruka Devada and Scaramouche, but the latter demonstrated a weakness in the system. Erminsel only deals in facts, so encrypting events within works of fiction, well, that's where novelists like Anders' daughter come in, because they can effectively circumvent any tampering that Erminsel does. Now, elemental energy also flows through Erminsel and its roots, which we call the ley lines. And that energy, coupled with Erminsel's memory data, is what is used to transmute objects through the process known as alchemy. This is Rheindotter's area of expertise. And with the help of the 1.1 event, Unreconciled Stars, we are able to connect constellations to crystalline fruit known as Erminsel fruit. This ends up being Barbelleth's realm of study since constellations form the basis for hydromancy's astrological divination. So basically, these ladies are studying how the world of Tevat works and potentially taking some measures to change things to their liking. This is mostly based off of Scarlet's comment when she says that she'd always thought the Hexen Circle could control the fate of the world, coupled with the intro screen that, uh, you know, looks suspiciously like an intertwined fate. Now, there doesn't appear to be any kind of restriction on who or what can become a witch or a mage. You could be human, you could be non-human. Alice, for sure, is not human. But what they all do seem to have in common is their theming. As far as I can tell, all Hexen Circle members are either characters from classic literature, a reference to a classic author, or a character from Greek and Gnostic mythos. Now that last one might seem like two unrelated things, but Gnosticism has Greek roots, so it's not as much of a stretch as you might think it is. In this light, Venti's connection to the Hexen Circle makes a little bit more sense because Venti's name in Chinese is actually Wendy, or Windy, I think is supposed to be the pun there, but Wendy reminds me of Peter Pan, so that kind of checks that box, and plus he's a bard, which makes him someone who records legends and events through poetry and song, and that's very on brand for this little witch club. Now, all of that aside, it does feel a little too early for me to speculate on the Hexen Circle's exact motives and purpose, so let's just leave our overview there for now, and instead go over each of the witches in turn, starting with the ones that we know the least about, and then we're going to speculate on one member that I think is a member, but I'm not quite too sure on, and we're going to finish everything off with Alice, because, well, you'll see when we get there. First up, we have I, Ivanovna, N. Codename, J. J is definitely mortal, or human, having died centuries ago after marrying her love, only to have to end his life herself. That's kind of rough. Now, admittedly, J is the only member I can't really make work with the themes that I mentioned earlier, but the main reason for that is that we don't actually know her name. In some Slavic countries, a person's full name has three parts, a first name, their father's name, and then their last name. Ivanovna is a reference to her father, whose name would have been Ivan. That means her first initial is I, and that's where things get a little tricky. See, every other witch seems to have their code name based on their first initial of their first name, so technically she should be I instead of J, right? But the thing is, the letters I and J were actually interchangeable for much of history, so her name really could start with either? And then on my Discord channel, Aluslaw suggested that she might actually be referencing Baba Yaga, whose name can be spelled with a J rather than a Y. This character is classified as a witch, and while a lot of folklore has demonized her, her true origins appear to be more of an ambiguous trickster character. She features in a couple of love stories like the Frog Princess, where she helps Prince Ivan marry the princess he loved. What confuses me, though, is that despite the raven being somewhat associated with Baba Yaga, in Genshin it's more commonly associated with Princess Fischl. And the fact that Jay dances upon a stage that resembles the raven theaters from Fischl's Golden Apple Archipelago Island event, I don't know, I, I just, I, I don't think she is Fischl, but it's a bit too on the nose of a reference to mean nothing. You know what I mean? And then we have Nicole, codename N, also known as the guide who will never get lost. She's actually the second Hexen Circle member we ever spoke to, although she's technically first since her voice appeared in the inversion of Genesis Archon Quest, while Alice has still only spoken to us during events or collected miscellany narrations. I think that 
Like Alice, Nicole might actually not be human. When Alice imitates her, she says, it's a fool's errand to mimic and learn from humanity, which just makes me think that Nicole herself seems a bit removed from normal humans in the same way that Alice had to be taught the concept of grief by a human. Now, as for potential references, in Chinese, Nicole is actually called Nike. And, well, Nike is actually the root of the name Nicole, too, so that checks out. But Nike is the Greek goddess of victory. But that title doesn't really fit Nicole, you know? However, Nike also seems to be a deity that's split from Athena, who was the goddess of wisdom, and now that's a moniker that would suit Nicole far better. Now, Nicole only seems to speak out whenever a change has occurred in the world, like a big one, like someone deleting themselves from the world's memory. This implies that she can detect alterations within Ermensel and may even be immune to Ermensel's influence, which is a trait that several of the witches seem to share. But her weird demeanor and her label as a guide aligns her with the concept of prophecy. Now, Athena did invent a method of divination, but prophecy was more her half-brother Apollo's domain. Now, Apollo is the deity of Delphi, formerly known for its oracles, and yes, you can indeed find a statue of Nike within the temples of Delphi. Am I stretching too hard? Yeah, yeah, maybe a little, but I don't really have much to work with here, you know? I have a lot more to work with with our next witch, though. Meet Anders Daughter, also known as Codename M. Now, I know I said that each member's codename was their first initial and M is not the first letter of Anders Daughter, but there are probably two reasons for this. One is that A is already taken, as Alice has it, and the other is that Anders' daughter is likely a surname rather than a first name. And this is based on the probability that she is a reference to Hans Christian Andersen, who was a very famous writer of classic fairy tales. Do you get it? Andersen? Anders' daughter? <laughs> uh. Anyway, she seems to have been an archivist of sorts, and she's also dubbed the legend that never ends. Now, if you think back to the inversion of Genesis Archon Quest, you may recall that Scaramouche had his memory data hidden within an allegorical fable about a cat that Nahida had created in order to circumvent the fallout of any potential data tampering within Ermensul during the operation. It was kind of just a backup, if you will. Now, since then, all fictional books in the game became suspect, as the probability that they described real events allegorically shot way, way up. Now, Anders' daughter wrote The Boar Princess, and if you look carefully, you may notice that it shares the same rose design on its cover as it does with The Pale Princess and the Six Pygmies, which suggests that she may have written both stories. The Pale Princess was the book that we helped Lisa recover in her story quest, and the Abyss Mage who stole it claimed it contained a secret. So it's a pretty logical leap to liken it to Scaramouche's little backup fable, you know? One more thing. In Mondstadt, roses mean that there is a secret to be kept. So says Noelle's character story, anyway. And this lines up with the meaning of roses in alchemy. They also mean that there are secrets whenever they appear in alchemical notes. So roses are probably something we should be on the lookout for, especially in fictional works. So Kuryu over on Twitter suggested that Boar Princess might be a reference to the fable of the Snow Queen, which was actually written by Hans Christian Andersen. Both of them tell the story of a girl who braves the ice and snow to melt the heart of a boy. Now the difference here is that the Boar Princess has a really messed up ending and the Snow Queen has a pretty happy ending, all things considered. Anyway, The Pale Princess and the Six Pygmies, on the other hand, is a reference to Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, a fact that is far more obvious in other languages. But Snow White was not written by Anderson, it was just a Germanic folktale that was popularized by the Brothers Grimm. It is a little weird that they're both about snow and ice royalty, though. It makes you wonder if the Saritza is connected to that at all. One other tale that may be related to Anders' daughter is the story of the tin soldier that appeared in Scaramouche's teaser. Now, this tale was also written by Hans Christian Andersen, so it's probable that Genshin's version was also written by Anders' daughter. So yeah, I guess really all I have on Anders' daughter is that she's an author, and she's probably referencing either just Hans Christian Andersen, or both Hans Christian Andersen and the Brothers Grimm, or just fairy tales in general. It's a little hard to say, but I thought it was interesting nonetheless. Let's move on. 
Barbella kind of confuses me because she's literally named after the first emanation of God, Barbello, and Barbello was basically ranked number two in heaven, just after God itself. So that just makes it feel really weird that she's here as a witch that invented a method of divination. It doesn't feel as impactful as you'd think it should. But then again, this really isn't the first time that Genshin has done something like this and named a character or an inconsequential one or a playable one after, you know, something that should have put them way up on the heavenly hierarchy, you know? There were a couple of characters in Enkanamiya, for example, that had names that should have put them on par with Fanes, and therefore the primordial one. But they ended up just being normal people, so I'm not really going to read too much into her name as it relates to her rank right now. But that said, Barbello was often called Thrice Powerful, and sometimes Thrice Great. Now, Thrice Great is exactly what Tris Magistus means, and if that sounds familiar, it's because Magistus is Mona's last name, and it was given to her by Barbelleth. So Mona's name is literally Mona the Great, or as Barbelleth likes to call her, Meg. Trismegistus is also a phrase used to talk about Hermes Trismegistus, or Hermes the Thrice Great, and he was a mythical figure considered to be the father of alchemy, so make of that what you will. Awkward segue, but according to Mona, Barbelleth has a great fondness for hats of all things, and if she picked out Mona's hat, then pointy hats are definitely to her taste. This is very fitting because Mona was the one to uncover the truth behind Pylos Peak, which is currently known as Musk Reef and houses a spiral abyss, and she did this during 1.1's Unreconciled Stars event. Uh, quick question, does anyone here know what a Pylos is? It's a pointy hat. That's it, it it's just a pointy hat. It's I just thought that was funny. And one last thing, I just wanted to mention that this star that shows up during Barbelleth's segment in the teaser is the same one that shows up in the cutscene from Mona's story in the last Golden Apple Archipelago event. And that kind of makes you wonder if Mona's event story was about her or her master, now doesn't it? Now, moving on to one of our more well-known Hexen Circle members, we have Rhine Daughter. She has quite a bit of lore littered throughout the game. She is a master alchemist, skilled in a unique branch of study known as Chemia, which can create life itself and was presumably the method by which Albedo was created. And this is why she's referred to as the flower that is not of this world. She can literally create things that do not exist naturally. Her nickname, Gold, has been cited as the name of the sinner who was directly responsible for the Conrian disaster. More and more doubt has been shed on this idea over time, but she's not completely absolved of the responsibility either, as it is true she was responsible for creating the dragon Durin, as well as the Rift Hounds. And of course, Albedo and his half-digested twin, but those two weren't really involved with the Cataclysm, so we'll just ignore that. But something that's not often discussed is Rhine Daughter's overall intentions when she created these seemingly dangerous monsters. For example, Albedo is stable and harmless and is considered the most perfect and complete of her creations, and yet he fears a day when his stability will wane and he becomes a danger to Mondstadt. Durin appeared to be a slowly decaying venomous dragon, but if you read the weapons that describe his point of view, it's very clear that he was a gentle dragon at heart who wanted to sing and share his love of the world with the others, like a young, innocent bishop child. And then we have the Rift Wolves, who are said to have been created as if by accident. So I don't know if Rhine Daughter really wanted to create these incredibly dangerous beings with the purpose of destroying Tavad. They must have had another purpose, and they just kind of backfired during the Cataclysm. We can look into this idea another time, but for now I just wanted to point out how odd her choice of creations really were. She chose to recreate a dragon, of all things, an incredibly powerful being from a primordial time that's particularly rare and modern to that, and then there's the Rift Wolves, who bear an uncanny similarity to Andreas, especially the Golden Rift Lord, which could potentially mean that Rhine Daughter was trying to replicate Andreas, or maybe revive gods that looked like him, and she was unable to. And I don't know, I just think that's pretty weird. As for references, Rhine Daughter is a very blatant reference to the uh, Rhine Maidens from the opera that was adapted from Germanic mythology known as the Ring Cycle. Basically, these Rhine Maidens were the daughters of the River Rhine and protected their father's magic gold, which makes sense with her nickname now, right? Gold? 
Now that Rheingold was eventually stolen by a pissed off dwarf that caused all kinds of chaos, so much so that even Odin himself had to get involved to put an end to it. Of course, this is an extreme summary because the whole opera is long, like super long, hours long. But it's still important to mention all of this anyway, because the pissed off dwarf was actually named Albrick, and the Albricks were the regent family of Conria, and they spawned the Abyss Order, so yeah, it's very possible that Rhindaughter and the Abyss Order are at odds with each other. If they're gonna follow the opera at all, anyway. I think that's all of the information I have for the currently confirmed witches, barring Alice, of course, who we'll get to, but I want to throw out the name of one more candidate. Her association with the Hexen Circle is entirely theoretical at this point, but I am feeling more and more confident as time goes on about one of their members actually being Skirk. Yes, the same swordswoman that child met as a kid when he fell into the abyss. I've pitched this idea before in other videos, but now I'm pretty confident in it. Here's why. The name Skirk has no obvious etymology. Now, trust me, I checked. But I have proposed in the past that this name might actually be Greek since the letters C and K are interchangeable there. So if we were to swap the Ks in Skirk with Cs, we'd end up with Circe, or perhaps Circe. This would make her a reference to a witch from Greek mythos, which is definitely on brand for the Hexen Circle since we already have Nike and Barbello and technically maybe Eris as a possible additional reference with Alice, but more on that in her own section. Now as luck would have it, Skirk has some thematic overlap with the powerful witch Circe, who's most notable to Western audiences for her role in Homer's Odyssey. Circe had a tendency to transform her enemies and honestly anyone who pissed her off into animals. Skirk also seems to possess an affinity for transformation magic. After all, when Child fell into the abyss as a kid, she taught him the foul legacy transformation magic. Plus, just her presence wandering around in the abyss ties back to this whole idea of Erminsel exploration since the abyss is where the tree's roots are located. For those reasons, I think Skirk is a really strong candidate, if not just a little speculative. Now, with my own personal speculation out of the way, there is only one witch left to discuss, and that witch is Alice. Alice, oh Alice, where do I even begin? Alice, codenamed A, is known as the one who would never lie, so either truth is very important to her or she prefers to speak in riddles. It's probably both given the nature of truth needing to be wrapped in allegory in order to survive Erminsel data tampering. Now, Alice, as well as Klee, comes from a line of long-lived people, I guess, which makes both of their ages nearly impossible to determine. By my estimates, Klee should be at least 20 years old, but still a child, and Alice could be hundreds or even thousands of years old. Now, besides longevity, this race seems to have pointy ears, which makes you wonder if Layla and Puccinella, who also have similar ears, are of the same race as Alice and Klee. That said, it is impossible to know whether or not Klee's father is also of the same race as the only thing we know about him is that he's an adventurer. Although it doesn't seem like he travels with Alice, which is odd because Alice is also an adventurer. She even does work for the Adventurer's Guild who publishes her to that travel guide. Now, in the same way Nicole could be based off of the Greek goddess Nike, Alice may have had partial inspiration from the Greek goddess of discord, Eris. In the most famous tale of Eris, she had not been invited to the wedding of Peleus and Thetis, and so she was pissed about it. So she took the golden apple of discord and threw it into the wedding venue. Every goddess there wanted the golden apple, so they began to fight each other for it until Paris was appointed to decide which goddess should have it. His choice led to the Trojan War. Now, I don't think I have to remind you that Alice is connected to the Golden Apple Archipelago. Do I? And like any good goddess of discord, she's also a pretty destructive troublemaker. I mean, she blew up a ton of Storm Terror's lair just to make it look more ruin-like. So she did it for funsies, you know? You can kind of see where Klee gets it from. I could also point to an entry in Before Sun and Moon where the name Eris is written using the same characters used for Alice's name, but I don't really want to dive too deep into the Enkanomiya rabbit hole today. 
But in addition to her destructive tendencies, Alice is a talented inventor who created tons of diverse things like a two-way radio, a cannon that can fly, lots of different explosive, elemental barrier, and gears that can literally raise and lower entire islands. I'm sure there are a ton more things that she's made that we've simply never seen before because Alice regularly sends her inventions and findings to Dory who buys them and sells them at a profit. And just like Nicole, Alice seems to have some level of resistance, or at least awareness, to changes within Ermansel, as she has replaced Dainsliff as a narrator for three separate characters. The first is Aloy, who is the only crossover character in Genshin and therefore not from this world, and then Wanderer, or Scaramouche, who deleted himself from Ermansel, and Dory, who has direct relationships with Alice. Curious that Alice did not voice Cleese, collected miscellany, but perhaps that's just because they hadn't cast her yet. Who knows? Now, some have claimed that this is proof that Alice is a descender, and she very well might be. But from my perspective, we don't know if there are other ways besides being a descender to circumvent Ermansel's tampering and what makes those types of people different from descenders, so it's possible that she is and it's possible that she isn't. But there does seem to be a lot more evidence that she is at least from another world based on her primary source of inspiration. And that inspiration, of course, is that of Alice Pleasance Little, the main character from Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and its sequel, Through the Looking Glass. Written in 1865, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland is an immensely influential work of classic children's literature that follows the main character, Alice Little, and her adventures traveling to fantasy worlds all of which feel like realms of total nonsense, because nothing makes sense there, almost like they have, you know, their their own laws. Kind of like Tevat. Now, the first book has Alice stumbling upon an anthropomorphic white rabbit and literally falling into a place called Wonderland. And in chapter three of this book, she meets a dodo bird, who is actually a self-insert for the author, Lewis Carroll, which was a pen name, by the by. His real name was Charles Dodgson, but he stuttered when he spoke, so oftentimes his last name would come out Dodo Dodgson, which made him Dodo Carol? Or Dodoko? Funny how this character looks like a little white rabbit, isn't it? In later chapters, Alice would meet the Hatter, the March Hare, and the Dormouse at their infinite tea party. And while Alice does love tea parties, she hated this one. It was the worst she'd ever been to. But as a fun little side note, and the reason I mention it, is that the character the Hatter is almost a perfect representation of the Connerians. See, his tea party is infinite because he once performed for the Queen of Hearts, and she hated his performance so much that she sentenced him to death for murdering the time, which is anthropomorphized in Wonderland. It's like sentient. He escaped, but time apparently showed mercy to the Hatter and froze his time at 6 p.m. forever, which is tea time. Hence, he has infinite tea time, which lines up with the weird Conrian curse of immortality, which tended to drive people mad and make them forget things. Which is funny because the Hatter was said to be mad because Hatters of the time used mercury in the felting process. And that, you know, seeped into their brain and kind of made them a little whoopy. But Mercury is the planet associated with Hermes, who is also known as Hermes Trismegistus, aka the father of alchemy. And Chemia was an alchemical art that was unique to Conria and was kind of said to, or at least implied, to be part of the reason why they got nuked. And these random connections just feel like forbidden knowledge. Uh, uh, but while I'm thinking about things I feel like I shouldn't know about, Dory also tells a rather odd story about Alice. She says that she found Alice trapped in a bottle and freed her from it, thus she earned Alice's favor. This tale is likely just a reference to how the djinn in Sumeru were said to have been trapped in silver bottles by King Deshret. And while it's incredibly unlikely that Alice was trapped in a Deshret bottle, because it would really screw with the timeline, this is still a tall tale worth analyzing if only because of the sequel to Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, which take her through the looking glass. Okay, so book two ditches Wonderland for a brand new world that Alice stumbles into by, you guessed it, walking through a mirror. The world on the other side of the mirror is one where logic is reversed. So running makes you stand still, walking away from things makes you move towards it, and you kind of get the idea, right? It's trippy. 
In addition to this, a good chunk of the world is actually an enormous chessboard, and she finds herself playing as one of the pieces in the most absurd game of chess that involves a forest, a train, a deer, and of course, a red queen. And as she progresses through the story, she meets a pair of twins, Tweedledee and Tweedledum, and they claim that she exists only as an imaginary figure from the Red King's dreams. In fact, the rest of the book plays around with the idea that life is nothing but a dream itself. Now I know it's a stretch, I mean this entire video is a whole series of stretches, but hear me out on this. King Deshret has a couple of aliases, Alamar and the Scarlet King most notably, but both of these just mean Red King, okay? He also created the Golden Slumber, which was supposed to be a dream-like hive mind. Now, in my Carrie Bear analysis video, I argued that Deshret may actually be the sinner, which would connect him to Conria. And in the Travail trailer, Conria was said to be full of those who dream of dreaming. And in the book Through the Looking Glass, Alice gets to that dream world by walking through a mirror, which supports a theme of reflections or inversions, something that Mona and Barbellus hydromancy uses in order to properly discern the future. Their craft has led to many theorists believe that to that is upside down, but it might not be upside down so much as mirrored, and the direction wouldn't really matter. You know how we have this weird paradox where we have one twin who belongs to this world and another who doesn't? Well, if they're just reflections of each other, then there should theoretically be a Tevat that is the inversion of the one we're currently exploring. And anyway, you know how I mentioned that the whole book had Alice playing as one of those chess pieces? Well, as it turns out, there is a variant of chess called Alice chess, which is complicated and confusing, but basically there are two chess boards now and only one set of pieces. When it's your turn, you can either decide to move your piece normally or warp it to the same position on the other side of the board. This is kind of like mirroring your position. Chess is only relevant to Genshin in this case because the gnosis that the Archons carry are chess pieces. And also because Deshret, this red king of dreams here, also has a chessboard. Deshret's chessboard is a little bit unique because it doesn't really look like a chessboard and it doesn't have traditional pieces. Basically every piece on the chessboard is actually like a model of a physical location that you can use to warp to. Weirdly though, that matches Alice's experience with the chess in the Through the Looking Glass book. Because remember, in that book, the chess that she was playing was like a really weird nonsensical version of chess. And so, I think this still kind of works, especially since that chess game was played against the Red Queen, and Deshret is the Red King, and this Red King of ours also made the Golden Slumber, which appears to be tied to the dream of the Red King, and Alice's story also begins with the poem on a golden afternoon. I hope you guys are still following this logic of mine. Anyway, back in my Carrie Bear analysis video, which I strongly recommend you watch, I made a case for Deshret to be connected to both King Solomon and also the Freemasons, which then reminded me of another organization called the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which is not to be confused with the Greek political party of a similar name, just to be perfectly clear. Now, the Order of the Golden Dawn was started by three Freemasons and is often credited as pioneering a lot of the practices that were later adopted into Wicca, which is what modern witches practice. One of these Freemasons was named Samuel Little Mathers. Coincidentally, the character Alice's full name was Alice Pleasance Little, and she was based on a real person, one of three sisters who inspired the story of Alice in Wonderland. And if Genshin's Alice's name is also Little, it means that Klee's last name is Little as well, which is hilarious because that makes her inspiration Little Red Riding Hood. Uh, anyway, the Order of the Golden Dawn's practices also line up with the interests of the Hexen Circle, minus Ermensel, of course, because that's not real. These practices included the teaching of the four classical elements, astrology, tarot divination, alchemy, scrying, and astral travel. We can probably lump the four classical elements together under alchemy since they're referenced every time you try to craft something. These four in particular might be important references to the four shades of the primordial one, and so too might the tarot. 
because like the four suits of the tarot are also classified under earth, water, wind, and fire. And we know for a fact that tarot was the inspiration for the types of artifacts characters can equip. There's four suits plus a crown, which represents the Omni element. And yeah, I am gonna stretch these tenuous connections even further. You see, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn might be directly referenced in the Dawn Winery. You see this red tea set here on Alice's table? There are only two other places in the entire game where we see this tea set. The library's waiting room during the Windbloom Pac-Man minigame, and inside the Dawn Winery. Although the pattern on this tea set is also found exclusively on D. Luke's black jacket. Now, lots of folks have pointed out that this might mean that D. Luke's mother was also a member of the Hexen Circle, and she very well could have been. If the Hexen Circle as an organization is really based on the Order of the Golden Dawn, then it implies that she named her son after the organization since D. Luke literally means Dawn, which is in contrast to his father's name, Crepus, which means Dusk. It also means the Dawn Winery was always fated to belong to D. Luke. Uh, curiously, since Kaya was left at the winery and he's Conrian, and the Hexen Circle had at least some role in the Conrian fall, courtesy of Ryan Daughter, it's very possible that they were responsible for Kaya winding up there specifically. And it also might explain why Kaya talks about a sword that heralds the dawn in his story quest. Now, alternatively, this red tea set may belong to Alice. During the Hidden Strife event, we learned that Alice wanted to take D. Luke in as one of her own after learning of his father's death. Around this same time, D. Luke made a contract with an unknown intelligence agency and joined them, making the Dawn Winery and Angel Share part of their network. It's very possible that this agency was the Hexen Circle, as they are, in many ways, an intelligence agency, studying the history of the world, recording it, and analyzing the future with its prophecies. This may also explain why it's a winery and a tavern, of all things. See, there's this one book called A Drunkard's Tale that shows a Seelie and a wolf, which was thought to be Andreas, having a conversation. And in this book, the wolf says this infamous line, what you call wine, we call the Abyss. With all these connections between the Hexen Circle and the Abyss, the tea party and the winery, you gotta wonder if there isn't something more there. I think I've rambled enough for today, so I'm just gonna let the names of all my spectacular channel members slide across the screen as a thank you for all the continued support and for helping me to make these videos possible. Now there's honestly a lot more I can talk about and lots of stuff I just did not cover today, like how Lisa and Senora are both considered witches and have rose motifs like Anders' daughter but still aren't members of the Hexen Circle, or how the blue roses on the tea party table are also only found in Lisa's library as far as I can tell, or how Sandrone might be a good potential witch candidate if she is in fact responsible for the construction of the Catherine robots and if the Hexen Circle is connected to the Adventurers Guild for realsies, or even what what was up with all those black and silver thorny vines and that callback to the Battle Pass cutscene and the Fatui Constellation wheel? So here's one last thought. There should be eight witch elders, but there are only seven chairs at the table. There is no real reason why we have to have eight witch elders, but consider this. There's one book that shares a similar rose motif to Anders' daughter's other books, and that's Hex and Hound. This book talks about a nobleman who got turned into a dog by a witch, who is actually not just one witch, but twin witches that share one body. Now what I'm wondering is whether or not this book is about a real witch in Genshin, and if one member of the Hexen Circle was actually two people sharing one body, just like the one in the book. And it was, you know, written down by Anders' daughter at some point. Alternatively, there are only seven chairs because Alice is always represented by the gramophone because she's always running around. Or one witch could have betrayed the organization. I'm looking at you, Sandrone. Okay, I'm, I'm really done this time. If you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. And thank you members for supporting this channel and a big round of applause to the Red Magic 8 Pro Gaming Phone for sponsoring this video. I appreciate every single one of you. So stay awesome and have a magical golden afternoon. Bye-bye.